Thanks for, uh, for that introduction, Nadia. It's wonderful. And uh, maybe we should say thank you to uh, ratemyprofessor.com or somewhere. I, I haven't seen those remarks before, but that's interesting that you dug them out. Uh, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I, I'm not used to standing at a pulpit of a church, uh, especially a Presbyterian one. I must admit, I'm not Presbyterian. I'm, I'm Catholic. Uh, some people say that that combination of a Palestinian Arab and a uh, and a Roman Catholic makes me half Palestine Liberation Organization and half Irish Republican Army. <laughs> so. And uh, basically, this morning, I'm uh, supposed to tell you something about, the, you know, how Palestinians are living under occupation. Of course, as you probably know, Palestinians now are divided into five different parts. There are Palestinians of the diaspora living all over the world, in Lebanon, and Jordan, and Syria, and now uh, the United States, Australia, whatever country. There is no country on earth that does not have some Palestinian nowadays. It seems every country I ever visit, I end up meeting Palestinians there. We're a people of diaspora as well. And then uh, there are the original Palestinians who remained on land, and they, in, by 1966, Israel granted them citizenship. Uh, so there are those Palestinians of Israel, mostly living in the Galilee region. And then there are the Palestinians of the West Bank, living under the Palestinian Authority, led by Mr. Mahmoud Abbas. And then there are the Palestinians of the Gaza Strip, living in an enclave that is surrounded uh, by Israel and Egypt on one side, but enclosed uh, 1.7 million people living in a region, an area five miles wide, 15 miles long, one of the most densely populated areas anywhere on earth. And they're essentially in an open air prison. Uh, the bulk of my talk, though, will concentrate on what's happening in the West Bank and Jerusalem. Uh, Palestinians living in Jerusalem and the West Bank have been uh, facing all types of uh, atrocities over uh, the years. They have been occupied since 1967, and from the beginning of the occupation, violations of international law, violation of human rights began. As soon as Israel occupied the territories, uh, actually as they were occupying the territories, they did not refer to them as occupied territories. They were referring to them as if you were listening to the newscasts from Israel at the time when the war was going on, the Israeli announcer would say, Israel, the IDF liberated territories east of here, territories in this area, liberated uh, rather than occupied. So from the beginning, Israel saw itself as liberating Jewish land, rather than occupying somebody else's land. And immediately thereafter, they expanded the borders of Jerusalem and annexed the city and declared it as their capital, uh, a declaration that is yet to be recognized by any country in the world. All right, uh, nobody the United States does not recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel yet. That is, we think in this country, they say it's a disputed area to be negotiated. Uh, we know better than that. Under international law, it's an occupied city, and there is no question about that. Uh, so, uh, because it is Jewish land, then Jews, naturally, have a right to live on Jewish land that Israel liberated. So they began to take over Palestinian lands and build what is called settlements, what I call settler colonies. Israel is a settler colonial state, essentially. They began to create Jewish colonies for Israeli Jews only on 
confiscated, essentially stolen Palestinian land. And that process continues till this day, until now. And now we have more than half a million Israeli Jews inhabiting uh, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. In 130 official settlements and 110 so-called unofficial settlements. These settlements have their own special roads. Recently, they even enacted another law saying, oh, buses have to be separated, special buses for settler Jews versus for Palestinians. Uh, they, there are so many closed military zones to protect these uh, colonies that Israel created in the West Bank. They created checkpoints and so on to ensure the safety of these people. In the process, they have taken over 42% of the West Bank. All right, under international law, uh, of course, the acquisition of territory by war is illegal. To tell me this is Jewish land, God gave it to the Jews, is something that I learned otherwise. I, I don't know about the Presbyterians, but Catholics really teach their kids in school lots of religion. And I learned that if God promised Palestine to anybody, he promised it to all, not to one at the expense of the other. The promise is to the descent, to the children of Abraham. And if we look at the Jewish Torah, the Christian holy book, we realize that the children of Abraham were two, not one. Right? One is Isaac, we're told he's the father of the Jews, and the other is Ishmael, we're told he's the father of the Arabs, right? So if there is a promise, it's promised to both, not to one at the expense of the other. But anyhow, I, I personally, I'm not into... Uh, believing in God preferring one people over other people because of their accident of birth. That is something I can't agree with personally. The God I believe in is, is a just God. A God who will not discriminate between one and another because of one's accident of birth. If God did that, then God would be racist. If God was racist, I would be telling you I'm an atheist because I couldn't believe in a racist God that will prefer one group of people over others because of no control, because of an accident of birth. Uh, the settlements, of course, these colonies brought in settler violence. So Palestinians are constantly exposed to settler violence uh, by armed religious extremists. Attacks increased between 9, 2009 and 2011 by 144%. Settlers attacking Palestinian children heading to school, attacking farmers trying to harvest their olive trees, or burning down crops, or throwing their sewage over Palestinian lands in Palestinian neighborhoods and so on. Uh, settler violence continues on a daily basis. Our media doesn't cover it. We don't hear much about it. You really need to read Israeli media to know about it. Uh, our media somehow disregards it altogether. Um, but the, the, an extreme example of settler violence was uh, carried out by Baruch Goldstein, if you remember, back in 1994, an American medical doctor who decided to go to a settlement near Hebron and then one day he decided to go to the mosque or temple of Abraham in Hebron where Muslims were praying killing 29 people uh, before he himself was killed. Uh, of course uh, Israel annexed East Jerusalem and with that annexation uh, it uh, expropriated so far 5,776 acres of Palestinian lands in Jerusalem. And while the Palestinians of Jerusalem contribute 40% of the taxes to the municipal authority, they receive only 8% uh, 
uh, that they get back in services from the municipal authority. Israel continues to take over Palestinian homes to build settlements or colonies around Jerusalem, and they are trying to Judaize Jerusalem by every mean, uh, one building at a time. Uh, so far, they have destroyed 2,000 Palestinian homes in the city of Jerusalem, and they continue that process uh, on a regular basis. Israel, of course, to ensure that these settlements are protected and the Palestinians are kept apart away as uh, they needed to have an apartheid system, of course, so as, as you believe this is your land and you allow your people to come and live there, then your people follow one set of laws, the Israeli civil law. But the people living there that you came to, the Palestinian Arabs, whether Christians or Muslims, that they were put under military law. So we ended up with a dual system of law. Under international law, and in the, my field of political science, we define apartheid as keeping the groups apart by law on the basis of their accident of birth. If you're born Palestinian, you're under this set of law. If you're born Jewish, you're under that set of law on the same land. That is the definition of apartheid. Israel has been leading an apartheid system, not in the last year or two or ten, but since 1967. In fact, one can argue they had an apartheid system before, since 1948, in that between 1948 and 1966, the Palestinians of the Galilee were put under martial law as well, treated differently without given, given the rights. So the only time Israel didn't have an apartheid system was 66-67. When, because in 66 they gave the Palestinians of the Galilee the rights to vote, Israeli citizenship, and in 67 they took over the West Bank and Gaza and Jerusalem. So, uh, other than that, Israel has had an apartheid system ever since. All right? They're constructing a wall to protect these settlements and maintain them within as much as possible Israeli jurisdiction. You saw the wall. Israelis call it security fence. Uh, in most places, it's a very high wall, more than 25 feet tall. The Berlin Wall was, what, something like eight feet high. This is 26 almost feet high. And it spreads long, long way. So far, they have built 325 miles of that wall. By the time it is done, it will be 440 miles. In the process of the wall, as it comes in to engulf settlements and to take areas of interest that have minerals or water resources or agricultural land that Israel would like to have for Israel, Israel has effectively annexed 46% of the West Bank that falls on their side now of the wall. Of course, they have uh, checkpoints to protect the uh, settlers. And there are, on average, 500 checkpoints throughout the West Bank. And there are many times when you have what the Palestinians call Tayyar, or the flying checkpoint, which just appears somewhere. All right? You never know. And at these checkpoints, uh, you, of course, have to be uh, stand and wait in line. If it's a car that you're uh, driving, you're going to wait maybe an hour, maybe two hours, maybe three, who knows? And then they're going to ask you questions. Of course, they're going to ask you for your ID card. And for the Palestinians, the ID card is like the American Express card. You don't leave home without it. Remember that commercial? Because if you're caught without your ID card, you're going to jail. 
you are in serious trouble. All right? Uh, at these checkpoints, many people have died. Sick people trying to go for health care, waiting in line an hour, two, or three. They collapse and die. Pregnant women having children at the back checkpoint or others dying at the checkpoint because of lack of facilities as they deliver the child in an ambulance. Uh, these checkpoints are so common. And they prevent the Palestinians from accessing many areas. Uh, they're rerouting many people, villages, towns, from each other. The, what, you, what takes you 10 minutes to go from one place to another now could take you two hours because you're going into the small roads all around hills and mountains to avoid being anywhere near a settlement, a colony. The way uh, between Bethlehem and Ramallah, for example. It's a mere 17 miles. Before the occupation, as I was growing up there, it took me, what, 15, 20 minutes, and I'll be in Bethlehem. Today, for the Palestinians to go to Bethlehem, they have to go all around on winding mountainous roads and so on that take an hour, hour and a half. And if there is a, a Tayyar checkpoint in the way, it could take you three, four, five hours. Okay, uh, so when American tourists don't see that because you don't go these roads. They don't take you on these roads. They take you on the settler roads. So you go and tour there and you never get an idea. Yeah, there is a wall, but you don't see much about what the daily life of a Palestinian is like. Even though you're there meeting with them and talking to them, you still don't realize that, hey, what took you 10 minutes to get to the Church of Nativity from Jerusalem is going to take the Palestinian, well, forget Jerusalem, because for the Palestinian of Bethlehem, they cannot go to Jerusalem without permit. And a permit is not easy to come by. Uh, uh, so in reality, many Palestinians are prevented from praying in their holy places in Jerusalem. All right? When Jordan had the West Bank, the Israelis were upset, saying, hey, Jews can't pray in Jerusalem. Well, Israel now is in control of Jerusalem, and Christians and Muslims can't pray in Jerusalem. And nobody's raising a voice about that. All right? Uh, for many Palestinians, the prevention of reaching their lands includes... Uh, or meant that 80% of the Jordan Valley, very rich agricultural area that belonged to the Palestinians, is inaccessible to them now. They cannot even enter it. Checkpoints prevent the Palestinians from reaching those. Of course, we see continuous destruction of property. So far, 24,800 Palestinian homes have been demolished. They exploit Palestinian natural resources uh, in uh, these areas. They take the water of the Palestinians. Settlements have swimming pools, have continuous running water, while Palestinians in Bethlehem or in Ramallah or in Naples will get the water if they're lucky once or twice a week. And they must have a tank on top of their house to reserve some water when the water is not running because it doesn't run regularly, uh, while Israeli settlers nearby enjoy swimming pool, constant running water, irrigating grass in their yards and so on. Uh, very unequal distribution of Palestinian water that they're taking from the Palestinians under, under their ground. Uh, and uh, Israeli settlers have so far uh, destroyed more than 10,000 trees, Palestinian trees, mostly uh, olive trees, uh, in order to make life difficult for the Palestinians to live and to uh, move them away from their agricultural land and open the way for more settlements or expansion of settlements, all right? Uh, the prisoners, I mean, I, I could go on and on and on about these things, but Palestinians have experienced imprisonment on a regular basis. So far, um, I guess uh, Shimon Shapiro, was it, uh, 
who told us a few weeks ago in her arts that uh, according to his count, 880,000 Palestinians have spent time in Israeli jails since 1967. All right, that's a figure coming from an Israeli newspaper, an Israeli commentator there. Uh, in these prisons, they uh, face torture. Many people are tortured. I know my own brother has been in prison in and out many, many times, and he lost the hearing in one ear. Why? Because he, one of the hits was on his ear. It was so severe that he lost his hearing in uh, that ear. Uh, they uh, talk about uh, deprivation of sleep. Jonathan could tell you a lot about uh, your, your work in that area is amazing, uh, documenting uh, the treatment of Palestinian prisoners. So I, I don't need to s uh, spend a lot of time on it. So far, about 100,000 Palestinians have spent time in Israeli jails under what is called the administrative detention. That is, Israel detaining Palestinians without charges, without trials, for indefinite periods. Often it starts with six months, then then renewed for another six, or it could start for a year, renewed for another year. Many people could spend as much as 10 years in jail without a right to a trial, without seeing an attorney or having a trial, without having any charges on them. And those who have charges against them, who end up in court, they end up in military courts where the documents and the evidence is all in Hebrew. And most Palestinians don't know Hebrew, but they don't even have access to it because it is secret evidence. Secret evidence. They or their attorney cannot see it. How wonderful. That's a democracy uh, we all love. I think... I, I think we have a big job in this country. I know the Palestinians are struggling to achieve liberation from occupation. We need to start a struggle in this country to liberate our own Congress of the United States of America, because it too is Israeli occupied territory. We need to work on that. We need to make a change in this country and wage that struggle to liberate our own society from that kind of Israeli occupation as we help the Palestinians liberate themselves from their own occupation. I, uh, of course, we have constant killings, murders of Palestinians. We have collective punishment. I don't know if any of you read or heard about a couple of weeks ago in uh, the town or village of Nabi Saleh. That's near the wall. People demonstrated against the construction of the wall. What did the Israelis do? They sent trucks with hoses and they start spraying all over skunk smelling liquids on the houses, inside the houses with windows open, on the yards, on the pets, on the people, everybody in the street. That is called collective punishment banned under international law. Collective punishment comes in many, many different forms, and Palestinians face it on a daily basis. But the Palestinians don't take it standing still. They resist. There is a long history of resistance. And that resistance, just like Jonathan said, is mostly nonviolent. It's not, I mean, it's rare that Palestinians carry out violence. They have, and those become big headlines, and oh, Palestinian terrorists, Arab terrorists, Muslim terrorists, uh, all of a sudden becomes headlines, and that's what sticks to the minds of people. But when Baruch Goldstein does the same thing, we say Baruch Goldstein. We don't say Jewish terrorist. Israeli newspapers would, but not us. Not in this country somehow, all right? Or when a Christian does something similar, we call him Timothy McVeigh. 
We don't say Christian terrorist. But when an Arab or Muslim does it, oh, Islamic terrorist, label one and a half billion people on earth by the behavior of one or 19. So we need to begin to work on that, to correct our media, to make sure they're honest and fair and equal. And if they say they're giving us the news, give us the news. Don't give me adjectives. They dismiss great people, great events, by adjective, by adding a label of terrorist or warlord. I don't know what's a warlord or strong man or whatever it is always. And watch for those. Once they have adjectives, it becomes opinion. It's no more news. Don't call it news if you're going to add adjectives. Otherwise, explain these adjectives and prove them to me. The Palestinians are resisting. They will continue to resist. We have splits. We have problems, as Jonathan mentioned, of course. We have issues to correct among ourselves. But we have a people with a spirit of resistance. They will not quit. Every day, Palestinians are standing, demonstrating against the construction of the wall. Every day, Palestinians are going on hunger strike in prisons to demand their release or to demand justice, to demand a trial, or to demand uh, better conditions for Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. Palestinian struggle continues and is not likely to stop. There is nothing to stop it. The spirit of the Palestinian struggle can be summed up by it. Uh, an example I can give you from uh, when I was there back in 87, 88, I was a senior Fulbright professor, was supposed to go teach at Birzeit University. Of course, the university was ordered to shut down by the Israelis. We shut down, but we refused to stop teaching, so we started teaching in different places all over the area. Uh, but during that time, I, I uh, remember uh, a case that I, it will stick to my memory forever. Uh, I saw, I was standing on the main street in Ramallah. I saw uh, four Israeli soldiers dragging a young man, probably 20, 21, 22 years old, and Palestinians gathering around, screaming at the Israeli soldiers, saying, leave him, leave him alone, he didn't do anything, he didn't throw stones, and screaming at the soldiers. As they came nearby me, dragging that young man, trying to get to their jeep, probably to arrest him, to take him for arrest in their jeep. As they came near me, a young lady appears in the midst of the crowd, carrying a baby on her arms. And that woman begins to scream too. But unlike the rest of the crowd, she was screaming at the young man being arrested, telling him, I told you today was too tense to take the baby to the doctor, but you didn't listen to me. You're so stubborn. You're just like your dad. I had it with you. Here is your baby. Here is your girl, she said. I'm going to leave you. I don't want to see your face ever again. And she puts the baby in his lap. The baby is ready to fall. Some soldiers will help. And the man ends up carrying the baby, the crying baby. And then that young lady runs away and disappears into the crowd. Now the soldiers are in a dilemma. You're going to arrest this man, but at the same time, he's carrying a crying baby. What do you do? One of them walks to the jeep about 70 yards away, talks on the wireless, comes back, kicks the young man away, uh, kicks him with his boots, and tells him, go away, don't do it again. And the four soldiers walk to their jeep and drive away. People are congratulating the young man. Hey, don't worry about your wife. She will come back. Everything will be okay. The main thing, you didn't get arrested. Wonderful. The young man is in a daze, looking around. In time, the crowd disperses. The young man is still carrying the baby and looking in, in a daze. 
And then it seemed like a long time. I'm sure it wasn't that long. The young man appears from behind the curb. The young lady, the mother, comes to the young man and tells him, give me my baby, go in peace. I talked to that young man afterwards. He assured me that he was not married, he had no children, he never knew that woman. This gives you an idea about the spirit of resistance of the people of Palestine. They are not going to quit and they will find the most revolutionary and innovative ways to continue the struggle until justice and only justice is achieved. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.